We're back with the Kara Project. I'm Heather. I'm Sarah. And in each episode, we've been using the Kara Bible Study Guide to ask questions to of how to study the Bible and be able to read the Bible on its own terms. You know, if you haven't downloaded the guide, you can visit our website and get it right off of there and follow along with us. But the other way you can follow along is we actually provide Bible studies with the questions we use in each of these episodes to help you study alongside of us or even study these passages on your own. So you can check them out on our website. Today, we're specifically tackling a very difficult or even confusing passage, and we're going to look at a couple of verses, um, some that many of you may have heard. Regardless of whether you've grown up in a church or read the Bible a lot, you probably have heard the term born again. And so one of our verses today talks about born again, and we may have never stopped to think about what that term or, you know, what it actually is meaning when we say born again. And so this is going to be fun for us to dive in together, Sarah. I'm excited about this. We're going to be studying in John 3, uh, verses 3 and 5. Don't worry, we'll get to the middle part too. But in John 3, uh, verse 3, it says, Truly I tell you, unless someone is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And then in verse five, it says, truly, I tell you, unless someone is born of water and the spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. We have two phrases in here of born of water and born of spirit and, um, and born again. And there's all these born things, Sarah. I'm hoping that this is what we're addressing today. Um, where, how do we tackle these passages? Well, I think it'd be wise to start by acknowledging that we bring certain assumptions and biases to the text. This Mm -hmm. is one of our applied questions. As you said, especially the born again passage or phrasing, people might be quite familiar with, or or you've at least heard it, Mm -hmm. um, and there's going to be some association that you have with that phrase, what in the world does it mean? Mm -hmm. Uh, It's it's good to at least bring those to light. As I was doing some research, and um, there's a couple interpretations that I thought I would at least... um, shout out here. Uh, When it comes to born again, is it talking about a second physical birth? Are we talking about reincarnation? Mm -hmm. Or are we talking about a a spiritual birth? And with born of water, again, it could be a physical birth. Or is this talking about repentance? Or um, could it be figurative language? Mm-hmm. And we, because we see a lot of that in the Bible too. Yeah, and born of water can sometimes be known as for baptism. And so this will be interesting yeah. to see to see how we unpack this and what the Bible is actually saying on its own. And, terms. and those are just a few of the many yeah. different interpretations that are out there, right, uh, right. Covering these passages. So where do we want to start? Yeah, context okay. as usual, of course. Yeah. That's good <laughs> yeah. because we have to at least see where we are in the Bible to be able to place ourselves. It's like putting ourselves in the middle of a map. Absolutely. Um, so we we are just reading from John chapter three. Um, this is early in Jesus's ministry. Prior to this, at the beginning of chapter two, we see that Jesus had performed his first miracle, turning water into wine at a wedding celebration. Yep. And then at the end of chapter two, I'm going to pick up in verse 23, and it says. While he, Jesus, was in Jerusalem during the Passover festival, many believed in his name when they saw the signs he was doing. Jesus, however, would not entrust himself to them since he knew them all, and because he did not need anyone to testify about man, for he himself knew what was in man. Um, this is this is an interesting passage here, and, and people are seeing these signs that Jesus is doing. Now, John doesn't really give us a lot of clarity on what signs he's talking about. I mean, there was one miracle, the water into wine. Mm-hmm. But in the other Gospels, we know that early in Jesus' ministry, he was doing a lot of healings and different miracles mm-hmm. that people were uh, just flocking to him. Right. And so they're being drawn, and they believe that Jesus has some kind of power or authority. They believe in these signs, but it says Jesus didn't entrust himself to them. Why? Jesus knows their hearts. He knows what's inside them. He knows that they don't really believe in him Mm. and who he is, but they do believe and are attracted to these signs. Well, that's an interesting warning sign for us. It's possible for you to believe in Jesus, but not necessarily, and believe he's real, but believe in his signs. That doesn't necessarily mean that you know no know him, right? Like you actually understand who he is. That's exactly right. Yeah. It is a good warning. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And so immediately following this, we now are now in jap- uh, chapter three, we're going to introduce to a man named Nicodemus. And in verses one and two, it says, there was a man from the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to him at night and said, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God for no one could perform these signs you do unless God were with him. So we'll, we'll 
dive more into who Nicodemus was later, mm -hmm. but there's a couple questions I might ask as I read that. One is, what does Nicodemus know about Jesus? Mm -hmm. And the other being, what does Jesus know about Nicodemus? Oh, yeah. Um, but the first one, what does Jesus know about Nicodemus? The other one, Nicodemus knows about Jesus. Yes, thank you. All right, we're yes, good. Yes, that one. Yeah. Um, well, he calls him a, a teacher. Which is what yeah. rabbi means, right? Yes. Okay. Yeah, so kind of a fellow, fellow rabbi. Right. Um, so he calls him a teacher, and he recognizes that the signs that he's doing are so powerful, and there's so much authority, that they, he must come from God. He right. must... Um, God must be with him well, in yeah, some way. Nic Nicodemus is paying attention because yes. there's something going on here with this Jesus guy. Yeah. I like it. Yeah. Um, so what must Jesus know about Nicodemus? Well, as we just learned at the end of chapter two, Jesus knows what's within man. Jesus mm -hmm. knows his heart. So he knows um, what Nicodemus is missing mm -hmm. here. And so he, we see what I think in Jesus's response in verse three that I'll read in just a second, I think Jesus is going, okay, well, here's, here's what you're missing. Mm. So in verse three, this is how Jesus responds. Jesus replied, truly, I tell you, unless someone is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. So, and there's our first verse. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, and when we read this verse, we want to kind of start to ask some questions. Yeah. You know? Um, and that's one of the things that we have under uh, research in the mm -hmm. CARA study guide is what observations or questions do you bring? Um, the big one that we already introduced, really. What is born again? Uh, yeah. <laughs> what, what do you mean by that, Jesus? <laughs> um, and again, I, I briefly hinted at these before, but there's three common interpretations. And I'll just touch on these real quick. One of them is uh, this idea of reincarnation. Mm -hmm. And that's the idea that when you die, you're going to enter another mortal body. And this cycle will repeated, be repeated over and over again until you reach the state of perfection or navar uh Nirvana. Nirvana. Yes, thank you. <laughs> um, but the Bible doesn't support this. And yeah. we see that actually in Hebrews 9.27, that we die once and then and then we face judgment. So not only does the Bible not support it, it actually Contradict. it contradicts yeah. Yeah, what the Bible says. Um, nor does Jesus say here that you have to be born again, then again, then again. Oh, yeah. So, if that reincarnation thing of multiple yeah. times, he would have probably said yeah. something like that. So anytime the Bible, it, it's something, our, inter our interpretations contradicts, you know, something else the Bible says in other places, that's not, that can't be the correct interpretation. Yep. So we're going to move on. Um, could he be talking about a physical rebirth? You know, the idea of reentering a mother's womb. And that does sound pretty absurd. Well, yeah, but I mean, it is a ridiculous, but isn't that how Nicodemus actually interprets the passage? I mean, if you're, if you're reading along, it's, he says, how can anyone be born when he's old? I mean, this is verse four, right? After this, he's yeah. like, can I enter my mother's womb a second time and be born? Right. We see like Nicodemus kind of asking these questions, which I adore because it reminds me so much of the disciples and how they were constantly <laughs> asking questions to Jesus when what Jesus said didn't make sense at face value. Um, I, this is a part of me that wishes we could see or hear the tone of Nicodemus. Nicodemus, yes. of like, how was he asking this question? Was he asking with clarity and like, Lord, help me, like, you know, Rabbi, help me know what this means? Or was it kind of like pushing Jesus and being like, dude, really? Like, what? what a little snarky. Yeah, what are you doing yeah. here? Um, you right. Know, but regardless, we see that Nicodemus mm -hmm. is asking, you know, a question because he's trying to get Jesus to keep explaining. Yeah. He's trying to keep that thought along. And so it leaves the, us as readers even on the edge of our seat of, okay, what it, what is it that he Jesus is, is talking about? Um, it's not reincarnation. It's not a physical birth. So what's what's our other option, Sarah? The, the third option here is a spiritual rebirth, mm. a spiritual birth. Mm -hmm. And and we can actually do a word study here that will kind of help highlight this. This is under the research arm yep. of the car guide as well, yep. right? Okay. Yep. And so when we look at the word again in, in the Greek language, it's anathen. And it can mean again, and it can mean from above. In fact, it is far more common to be translated as from above than it is as um, again. And we can see that in John 3, 31 and 1911, if you care to go, go look those up. But obviously Nicodemus interprets the, the more literal way um, as physically born again and asks that, you know, if a man can re-enter this mother's womb a second time to be born. Yeah. Well, and it, it probably makes sense in the context to be like how he'd be hearing it would make sense. But it is interesting because the NET, I was reading this earlier on, the NET translation and Amplified both use born of, um, uh, born from above, mm -hmm. which is interesting. If you know, Just a quick pause. If anybody doesn't know the NET or the Amplified, NET is kind of like a crowdsourced version of the Bible. Bible scholars will put their notes in 
and to keep the authenticity and the the um, um, uh, uh, real context of what the the verse is trying to get across in the original language. Amplified mm-hmm. has it's not a really easy Bible to read for devotional, but it does add additional words in par- parentheses behind a word mm-hmm. to help kind of triangulate around what a word meaning would have meant. So there, both of these translations, it makes sense that they would try to get to the original core of how this word would have normally been used, but it isn't in any of the other translations. They all say born again. Yeah. Neither the NET, the Net Bible or the Amplified, those aren't necessarily my everyday Bible, but I really do like looking at them, especially when I run into kind of a passage like this. Where there's a word, there's some words that we're trying to understand. And 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 a lot of the translations use kind of the same word. I, Mm -hmm. I would turn to these. That's right. Yeah. Um, So even without doing the word study that we did on again, or even without the translation help, we truly can even get to this understanding that this is a spiritual rebirth we're talking about just by context itself. Right. And so if we look um, back in context, one of the things that we might look for is you're looking for this related text, you Mm -hmm. know, like you're following this train of thought. And we see here a question and an answer. And anytime we see that, it's, you know, pay attention what the answer was or what the question was that preceded the answer. Right. Um, And so Nicodemus said in verse four, how can anyone be born when he is old? Again, so wish I knew the tone. Right. Nicodemus asked him, can he enter his mother's womb a second time and be born? And then in verse five, Jesus answered, truly, I tell you, unless someone is born of water and the spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. Whatever is born of the flesh is flesh and whatever is born of the spirit is spirit. So when Jesus answered Nicodemus's question, um, he's saying, Born again is not a a physical rebirth, but it's a spiritual Mm -hmm. rebirth. One must be born of the spirit. So this is helpful, but it makes me wonder what does it mean about being spiritually reborn or having spiritual rebirth? Like, what does that yeah. look like? And how does one experience it? I'm sure that that's what Nicodemus was probably asking right? too yeah, in this sure. moment. <laughs> so Hence the absurd question. A little bit, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And that's a great question. And I think there's a lot of places we could turn to to look at what does this born again life mm-hmm. look like? How is one born again? Um, let's just keep close to home here. And let's look at... Um, because the New Testament does talk a lot about this. Mm-hmm. We could find for verses after verses, but you're going yeah. to keep us where in John? And let's, let's stay in John. And, and it's a good question, right? Because Jesus said, unless you're born again, you can't enter the kingdom of heaven. Yeah. So it's it, important. It's, it's a big deal. Yeah. So in John 1, verses 10 through 13, it says, he, again, Jesus was in the world and the world was created through him. And yet the world did not recognize him. He came to his own, his own people did not receive him, but all who did receive him, he gave them the right to be children of God, to those who believe in his name, who were born, not of natural descent or of the will of the flesh or of the will of man, but of God. Mm. So we, we learn here that we become children of God when we receive Jesus, when we believe in Jesus, we're not children of God by natural descent. That's good clarity. And mm-hmm. also right within like a couple of chapters before this, it's almost as if John knew he was yeah. going to end up talking about being born again later on to be able to like... He's building they're on... They're building on yes. this, this case of, of so, what he means. Yeah. So when we believe in Jesus, there is a spiritual rebirth that happens. We are born from above. Love that. Um, we also see this picked up immediately following our passage. If So back in John 3... If we were, these are, these are some of the, probably the most well-known verses in, in the Bible here. We're going to read John 3, 16. Um, if, but if we, I'm going to read verses 15 through 18. So Heather, as I read this, listen for repetition. Okay. And sometimes we want to do that. Under author, that's one of our things. Look for patterns. Repetition is a huge one, and it also is one of the easiest ones for me to spot. Right. Right? All right. So picking up in verse 15. It says, so that everyone who believes in him may have eternal life. For God loved the world in this way. He gave his one and only son so that everyone who believes in him will not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Anyone who believes in him is not condemned, but anyone who does not believe in him is already condemned because he has not believed in his name of the one and only son of God. Oh, I love this. You're hearing the word believe or mm-hmm. belief. There's this this definite rep- rep- uh, rep- repetition. Heather can't talk today. Repetition that we hear several times of your need to believe in, in Jesus. Mm-hmm. Um, and then you're going to have eternal life. Like it just makes that connection so yes. clear. It does. And isn't it interesting? You just mentioned eternal life. I, I found it interesting that as the conversation began with Nicodemus, he was referring to the kingdom of God. 
Mm. And now as the conversation is continuing, he's referring to eternal life. Oh, interesting. And these can kind of be Christianese terms, mm-hmm. you know, but he's refer he's he's referring to the same thing here. Yeah. Eternal life equating to uh, the kingdom of God. And isn't it interesting that he switches and 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 why does he do that? Mm-hmm. Well, I think he's pointing back to this comparison between this physical life and the the spiritual life. Born again is not physical. It's not reincarnation. It's a new spiritual life that will not perish. Oh, that's good. That's yeah. good. Remind, reminding him of what he means by it. I love that. Yeah. Yeah. So I think at this point, we've pretty well covered what um, what born again means. Yeah. Um, and a lot of it you're getting from the context yeah. for, around um, mm-hmm. the passage, which is what I love about the mm-hmm. Bible is that truly, if you don't just read one verse, but you read the stories and I mean, because the Bible was not written in that chapters and verses. Yes. So we need to read that context. It really did give us a lot more clarity. It did. Yeah, yeah it really does. So let's let's move on now to our second question, mm-hmm. um, which was again referring to what is born of water mean, right. right? So I'll go ahead and read that verse again. It's in verse five. It says, Truly I tell you, unless someone is born of water and the spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. Whatever is born of the flesh is flesh, and whatever is born of the spirit is spirit. So here, let's, again, we ask some of our questions, right? Mm-hmm. What observations or questions do you have about this? Under our research tab, yeah. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. What, what does born of water mean? And again, there are actually many interpretations on this one. Right. I, found, I found quite a few, and I'm only going to address two of them mm-hmm. here. Um, so the first one being born of water is referring to baptism, and so unless someone is basically saying, unless someone is baptized and, and born of the, of the spirit, you cannot enter the kingdom of God. Hmm. Um, uh, so it's, is the question being, is baptism required for salvation? Which is interesting. We're actually going to be touching on this in a future episode. We're going to be covering Acts 2.38 that talks about being yeah. baptizing and, and repenting. And so make sure to check that out if you um, are interested in the topic of baptism. I don't, I'm assuming for time's sake, we're probably not going to spend a ton of time here on it today. Right. We're not going to spend a ton of time today, but this does contradict what the Bible does say in other places. Okay. As well as what we just read in mm-hmm. John 3, the, the end of John 3 about believe in the Lord and you will be saved. Believe in Jesus. Jesus and you'll be saved. Je- Jesus never once says believe and be baptized right. in order to be saved. Right. He would have clarified it if yeah. that was actually part of the deal. Okay. Yeah. So if, like Heather said, if you want to explore that further, watch that podcast. Mm-hmm. Yes. Um, so the second interpretation here is that born of water is referring to the water in the womb. It's referring back to this physical birth mm-hmm. that he was really just talking about. Um, and so not only is this the simplest answer, but it actually makes the most sense contextually. Yeah. I mean, the the context right before it, it was uh, about the mother's womb and in verse 4. And the context right after it in verse 6 is talking about being born of the flesh. And it doesn't make sense that in the middle of verse 4 and verse 6, he suddenly started talking about baptism. Right. Or any other thing for that matter, because the verses themselves yeah. are, are pointing to this idea of flesh, of actual like body. Sometimes we have a tendency to overcomplicate things. A little bit. And I think this might be a case where perhaps the simplest answer here yeah. that we can see in context makes the most sense. Yeah. And was a theme that we were seeing in John. Yeah. Even completely. back in chapter one, as we, as we mentioned. Um, so we, we really, to, to address this further, let's... You know, we look at this context as we're talking about, and in verse five, we're talking about the water and the spirit. Mm -hmm. And then in verse six, the next verse, we're talking about flesh and the spirit. These two verses are comparing the same thing in both verses. Um, The first birth is of human origin of the flesh, and the second birth is God origin of the spirit. Which completely makes sense when you're reading the verses around it. When you read it all together, of course, it's almost Mm -hmm. like there's this parallelism or, uh, you know, he's kind of taking the idea and then he repeats it almost again in the next verse being like... Like it's not just born of, yeah. you know, right? It's that born of water, born of flesh. It's that same concept he's trying to get across. That's cool. Yeah. It, and this is a passage we encourage you to just go read it again and again. Mm-hmm. And, and and I think that you're going to start to see that as well. Yeah. Um, so at the end of the day, I mean, the, really, I think context solves that pretty quickly. What yeah, does born does. of water mean? So we've addressed what does born again mean. We've addressed what does born of water mean. But there, I still think at the end of the day, I'm like, well, 
why in the world, after I studied all of this, I kind of walk away and go, why was Jesus talking to Nicodemus about this? <laughs> why was he talking to him about being born again? Well, what were you, what was your point? Right. Where, you know, where were you going? Jesus, why are you using this language? Yeah. What's going on? I don't know if you do that, but sometimes after I've studied a passage, you get so in depth in it, you walk away, you're like, wait huh? a minute. <laughs> Um, all right. So let's, let's dive in and figure out who Nicodemus is real quick. And, yeah. and this is a history question. Yeah. Um, who was it written to? Who was it written about is the question we're going to be asking. Who was it written about and how does the Bible describe them? So if we go back and we already read this back in John 3, 1 and 2, and I'm going to read this real quick again, at least John 3, uh, verse 1. There was a man from the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews, and he came, let's see, I guess I'll go ahead and keep reading it. This man came to him at night and said, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God, for no one could perform these signs you do unless God were with him. Mm. So it refers to Nicodemus. It says that um, he was a ruler of the Jews. And that refers to the Jewish governing body known as the Sanhedrin. I'm, I'm getting some of these, this I found out of my CSB study Bible. It has gives me some commentary and some study notes to help me know what does that mean to be a ruler of the Jews. Um, and out of the Bible knowledge commentary, it's one of my, it's a great commentary. Mm -hmm. um, I learned that the, the Sanhedrin had 70 members who were responsible for religious decisions and also civil rule underneath the Romans. So there's religious uh, responsibility and authority as well as civil authority mm -hmm. being a part of, of uh, the Sanhedrin. Um, and then I, I found uh, something also interesting in Matthew 3, when the Pharisees showed up as John the Baptist, as he was baptizing and telling people to repent, and the Pharisees show up in that scene in Matthew 3, uh, John tells them, don't presume to say to yourselves, we have Abraham, ha Abraham as our father, for I tell you that God is able to raise up children for Abraham from these stones. Mm. The Pharisees, and the Jews in general, really, right. but but even perhaps more so the Pharisees, had a tendency to think, well, I am a child of Abraham. I That gives me auto an automatic ticket into heaven. Yeah, they actually were banking on this idea uh, that they were admitted to God's kingdom because of their birth, because of Abraham, because, mm -hmm. um, as, as their father. There was this absolute tie that they had. as their, So this, this would be interesting because that's kind of potentially what Nicodemus is probably thinking at this point, right? Well, that's what makes me wonder. And, and if Jesus here in John 3 is saying, hey, Nicodemus, don't bank on your birthright. <laughs> don't bank on your natural birth. Right. You need to be born again. Yeah. That's how we enter the kingdom of God. That's how we all, Jew, Gentile, that's how we enter the kingdom of God. As a spiritual rebirth, you become a child of God. Oh, that's huge. That's so, big. Mm -hmm. I like that a lot. Yeah. Um, and but there's one more question here, and I, I think I, I love that Jesus is responding and being patient with him and giving him this response because sometimes that's not the response we see from Jesus when no. he's talking to the Pharisees. No, he usually is pretty tough on them, yeah. right? But he's patient here with Nicodemus, yeah, he is. and Nicodemus is misunderstanding of of where he's going, mm -hmm. of what he even means. So it makes me wonder: could did he see an earnestness mm. in Nicodemus um, in the way he's addressing him and he's answering his qu his yeah. questions? Yeah. Um, so one of the, another history question that we like to ask is when did the events take place and what was going on in history at that time? And when we look back in, in, in chapter two, verse 13 and three, two, we can kind of start to answer some of these questions, but this was, uh, Jesus had gone to Jerusalem for the Passover mm -hmm. and during the Passover, there was a lot of people going to Jerusalem and, and it says that Nicodemus approached him at night. That's a very interesting detail. I get, I just say that I love this detail because yeah. if you, if the Pharisees, most of them were approaching him during the day, they were doing it out in a public form. They were almost trying to shame Jesus, show that they were so smart. And that's not what Nicodemus does here. It's in the cover of night. It's by himself. It's almost like he's trying to seek truth out yeah. without the guise of other people looking at him while he's questioning Jesus and asking these questions. You can see that he doesn't have this agenda. He just wants to know who Jesus is for real. That that earnestness that you just talked about, that desire to kind of seek is absolutely mm -hmm. coming through when I, when I read the words at night because I'm like, whoa, yeah. that, cha that changes it. Yeah. The, just knowing the, the, where the event took place changes how I view this passage because now I see that Nicodemus might have had a different thought of yeah. how he was trying to approach A curiosity, mm -hmm. uh, an earnestness. Oh, I love it. Yeah, that. no, that is great. Mm -hmm. So um, let's let's dive into trying to apply this. Anytime we pick up scripture, 
We really do. At the end of the day, we want to be able to apply this to our lives. Yeah. And one of the questions that we ask is, what fears or concerns do you bring to this passage? Oh. Um, when, when we talk about this idea of a new life, a new birth in Christ, what, what fears might come to mind? And it, and it kind of makes me think of Nicodemus and what fears might have come to his mind. Mm-hmm. He stood a lot to lose if he a chose lot. to follow Christ. Mm-hmm. Um, his position his, his, um, his, yeah, his, his power, mm-hmm. um, his livelihood. Well, yeah, this was his job. Being a Pharisee mm-hmm. was his job. And so you're talking about family mm-hmm. status, money, success, yes. power, all of it is something he, if he is changing the way that he views Jesus and the Messiah has come, that washes out their need for the Pharisees. Yeah. High cost. Very high cost. Uh, very high cost. So there's some real fears and concerns that we might have that, that relate to that. What uh, you know, I, I've heard this before. What might Jesus ask of me if I become one of his followers? Mm. You know, and mm-hmm. and so just hey, recognizing that we might have those fears and, and what they are and laying them before God, kind of the idea of what is holding you back? You know, mm. um, if, if your next step is possibly believing in Jesus, what is what is holding you back? What fears and concerns might you have in that unknown life? Mm. And just acknowledging those, because when we acknowledge them, then we can prayerfully bring them before before God. Mm. And that's another apply question is really to pray, Lord, how, how do I apply this to my life? And what do you want me to learn? And what do you want me to know? But I think God is honored when we bend our knee and, and say, this is what I'm afraid of. And just mm-hmm. lay it all out before him. I think he's honored by that honesty. Mm-hmm. Um, so, yeah, and, and Nicodemus humbled himself enough to be able to like go in the, the yeah. cover of night to say, Lord, I want to I want to know more about who you yeah. are. I love that. Yeah. So prayer is um, always a mm-hmm. good application to any passage that you study. Um, and another thing that we talk about is is to memorize scripture. Yeah. And we did, it was one of the verses we read here is was John 3, 16. That is probably the most well-known passage or most memorized passage yeah. uh, verse out there. Um, and the CSB translation says, for God loved the world in this way. He gave his one and only son so that everyone who believes in him will not perish, but have eternal life. Oh, that's so powerful. That's so powerful. Yeah. So, you know, thank you for walking us through this. I think we can walk away not only being able to um, put our fears at the feet of Jesus, but also be praying about what does it look like to be a follower of Christ and how, and the Bible gives us a lot of answers on that. And so mm-hmm. we're going to continue to dive into passages in future episodes that are going to address these type of topics. Thank you, Sarah, for walking us through a passage like this today. I hope it helps. Super helpful to understand this passage more deeply. And if you're interested in learning more about studying the Bible, you know, continue to subscribe to the CAR Project, visit our website. We have a ton of in-depth articles and resources that are meant to help you find joy through the Bible. And so we're just so thankful that you were willing to join us today. We'll see you next time.